gather in the Lord's house, especially if you are a guest or a visitor. It's great that you could be with us. This will be the last weekend the decorations will be up, and it'll be the last weekend we formally talk about Christmas this Christmas season. But we're going to see how it's something that truly does carry us through the year and ultimately carries us to our home in heaven. May God bless our time together gathered around his word. We begin as we meet with him. In the name of the Father who sent his Son, in the name of the Son born in Bethlehem as our Savior, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who creates in us faith to believe these truths, Amen. Amen. our opening hymn. We now, in word and song, focus on why we sing as Christians. Fellow believers, we don't sing tonight because we have to. We sing to praise our Savior, who humbled himself in every way possible. He was born in poverty. He was laid in a manger. He became one of us. And he did so that the light of God's grace may always shine brightly upon us. We don't sing just because it sounds good. We sing to express our appreciation that Christ descended to our level in order to bring us up to his. From the depths of sin, he rescued us. He came to us. He lived for us. He died for us. He is our Savior. Finally, we don't sing to impress others. We sing because the guilt of our sin and the shame that comes with it has been struck down. We sing because death no longer reigns. It has been beaten by Jesus. We sing because he who was born for us also lived, died, and rose for us.
May such joyous and faith-filled singing continue to flow from our hearts and lips always. Amen. Amen. We confess our sins to God. Knowing all we just read, said, and sang is true. In faith, let us come before our Lord, confessing our sins. Gracious Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us for the sins we committed by what we thought, said, or did. Forgive us for our sins of inaction. Forgive us for our sins of indifference. And forgive the sins of which we are unaware. Knowing why you sent your Son into this world, and knowing the work he did for us and for all, we humbly ask you to show us grace. Fellow believers, our focus tonight, especially during our sermon, is about keeping things simple. Thankfully, we can do the same regarding our need for forgiveness. So hear and rejoice over these gloriously simple truths. All your sins are forgiven. This is a gift to you from your triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Almighty God, this day you fill us with the new light of the word, Jesus Christ, who became flesh and lived among us. Let the light of our face shine in all that we do, all the time. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you hear our lessons, notice that certain words and phrases come up again and again, such as delight, praise, giving thanks, rejoicing, and so many others. As we hear our readings and as we take to heart the message they share, may our response to God's glorious truth echo the words of the inspired biblical authors. Our first lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 61 and 62. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jer Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet, till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication, and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Our second lesson comes from Ephesians chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. 
For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to his sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his, in his holy people. This is the word of the Lord. We join together in our verse of the evening from Psalm 98. Alleluia. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. This reading will also serve as a basis for our message tonight. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke of about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because He was before me. Out of His fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the gospel of our Lord. Seated for our hymn of the evening. It's newer words, but it's a pretty old tune. If you're unfamiliar with it, though, please feel free to pull out a hymnal from the pew in front of you.
We're in a new year, and you've probably heard plenty of resolution talk. I had somebody not too long ask me, are you going to resolve to talk about football less? And I said, that sounds like a challenge, and I'm going to win it. So, here we go. I'm not even going to trust this thing tonight, if you could help me out here. All right, so, you thought I was kidding. At KML, we run what is called split bag beer. A lot of people just call it the option. Okay, many of you are probably familiar with it, okay? Now, let me briefly, and I'll summarize this for you, talk about what happens. Wide receivers, they stalk back the defensive backs, take them out of the play. Backside linemen, usually tackle and guard, they will take a zone step play side, and they will scoop, working up to the second level. If no one's there, they go to the third level. The center kind of has those same rules, but usually he's covered either when he starts or when he moves. Playside guard takes his step, moves up, again, probably a linebacker, unless there's someone right on the line of scrimmage. Now things get a little bit tricky because tackle on out on an inside veer is the read key. So if the guy's shading inside, the tackle has to push him down. If he's head up, he'll either do a doodad or an inside cut, cover the linebacker. Tight end, he just gets out of the way. That's the big thing. Just get out of the way. Okay? Now, while all this is happening, the quarterback will take a 90-degree step, toward the play side, and he'll mesh with the running back, the play side running back. He'll put the ball right in his gut. And he has to read the read key, who was tackle on out. No one blocks it. So if that defensive end stays where he is, he gives the ball. Let's the, running, let's the dive back go. If that read key crashes down, he pulls the ball and starts moving outward. And the whole time, the backside running back, you're probably wondering where he was, he is getting in position behind the quarterback pitch relationship. Now, they get to the outside linebacker, that's the pitch key. But the same rules apply. You you attack him, you go directly at him. If he attacks the quarterback, the quarterback pitches. If he kind of floats, the quarterback keeps it, runs straight up the field. Okay. Now, the problem is you're dealing with high school gentlemen. And if you met one of them, they're not always the sharpest. And to make matters worse, they have three seconds to figure out what to do. Where's this guy? How should I react? And there's more than a few times they'll come off the field and their eyes are wide like I had no clue exactly what to do. All right, next one. Now, you can imagine the look on their faces too, and especially when it comes to the freshman or the sophomore. They'll be in practice maybe two, three days, and I'll give that little speech trying to drive the point home that they got a lot to learn, and they'll look at me like I just asked them to figure out the square root of some crazy number. And I had a number in mind, but I even forgot what the number was. So you get the idea. They're thoroughly confused. They just look at you like, no clue what's going on. Next one. So why did I take time to tell you that? Well, actually, I gave you the relatively short version. If you wanted, and if you've been to church here enough, you know I could go on for about 20 to 25 minutes on that one alone, giving you every bit of detail, the what's, the where's, the when's, the why's, and all that good stuff. But again, why are we talking about this now as we're putting a bow on the Christmas season and heading into Epiphany? Next. Well, of course, we all know what it is we've been celebrating the last couple of weeks especially. The birth of our Savior. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. It's something that's so easy to say, but do you realize just how profound that statement is? That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born as a human being and laid in a cattle trough. Frankly, it should absolutely blow our minds. And that really is the cliff note version of it. That play before, I can summarize it this way. Quarterback takes the ball. Based on what the defense does, he either gives it, keeps it, or pitches it. Okay? You can summarize it that simply. Well, can we fully understand the hows and whys of how Jesus Christ, true God, became a true human being? No. But we can summarize it, and even more so, We can find joy in it. We're focusing on our gospel lesson. You heard the first verse. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. If you're old enough, you've heard those verses how many times in your life? And so easily we can hear that and nod and think, yeah, that's that's really poetic. And yeah, that's really beautiful. But again, do you understand the depth of what we're talking about? Next We are here, like we said, to kind of put a bow on things, to wrap up Christmas and to get us moving forward. Next one. But we could easily, and we usually say things like this, don't focus on Christmas only in December. You hear that all the time. Keep the season going. 
But again, we hear about this, and when we really stop and think about what happened in Bethlehem, we have some pretty obvious questions. How can we explain true God becoming true man? We can easily ask again, how did this happen? Or how could God do this? That's like the full explanation of the play. It might be so much we couldn't even grasp it. And frankly, as sinful people, we can't fully understand exactly how Jesus, true God, became a true flesh and blood human being. The example I use in new member class is paper. And I know it sounds weird, but hear me out. We'll be talking about Jesus becoming true man, and I will hold up a piece of paper, and I will briefly explain to the person how paper is made. And then I will ask them a question, do you know why I can do that? And they'll usually get it right. They'll say, because it's a pretty simple process. And I said, yes. And my point is, if I could actually, me as a sinfully imperfect person, fully, perfectly explain how true God from all eternity became a flesh and blood human being that was about this big and needed to be nursed and burped and all those things, that would actually concern me. It actually comforts me to know that my God and my Savior is so much bigger than me. In this imperfect world, my mind would never be able to fully grasp it. But we do know the results. We know what we need to know regarding our Savior's birth. Next. We know that he was a 100% true man. Flesh and blood, human being, as much human as you and I are, except, of course, without sin. And why did he need to be? Well, he had to take our place. Our Savior had to live perfectly for us for all the times we have failed. There's a reason we confess our sins at every church service. Because we're always carrying them around. And every day we're committing more and more. Our Savior had to live in this world as one of us. And having done that perfectly, he had to sacrifice his life on the cross. The wages of sin is death. He had to die. Only a true flesh and blood human being could do that. And that's exactly what Jesus was. But at the same time, he was 100% true God. He never stopped being God. And he did that so he could be a fitting sacrifice. Had to be that way. Again, a new member class, I use the example of Lady Justice holding the scales. And I'll say, put humanity's sin on this side. Is there anything you can put here that's going to balance those out? And of course, the answer is no. But now you take Jesus, true man and true God. He truly is a fitting sacrifice. And as true God, he could win for us. He could make us what we could never be on our own. Beloved members of God's family, totally forgiven and bound for heaven. And that's who Jesus is. That's why he makes such a big deal. It's not just the Hallmark card or the happy feelings or even the Charlie Brown aspect of things. It's that he was 100% true man, able to take our place and die. 100% true God able to be a fitting sacrifice. He is absolutely everything we need him to be. Next. So John makes that point, then he says this. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. You may remember an older translation saying, we have received one gift after another. Such as, knowing this is who went to the, who was born in Bethlehem, the same one who went to the cross, what gifts do we have, what grace have we been shown? We have peace with God. I don't know if you've noticed, peace is not exactly a word I would use to describe the world right now or really ever. Whether there's a lack of peace in families or in nations or in congregations or even within ourselves. But because of who Jesus was and what he did, at this very moment we have absolute peace with God. Because through Christ all our sins are gone. And because of that we're part of the family of God. We don't call God Father just because it sounds cool. We call him that because he truly is our father, and we are his children. And he invites us to speak to to him, to talk to him, as a child has no problem talking to a parent. And because of what Christ did, we are trophies. We are trophies that our Savior won by his perfect work for us, washing us clean, and he lovingly, adoringly presents us to his heavenly father. This is what I have made them. They are trophies of your grace. Now, Sometimes in the midst of a heated football game, I'm up in the booth, I'll talk to Pastor Coach Reichel, and I'll say, go grab so-and-so and sit him down. And we have these iPads, and I'll have the guy, the kid look at the iPad, and I will say, block that guy. Forget everything else. Just block that one guy. Making it super simple so you can totally focus. 
Well, John does a beautiful job of summing up what this means for us, of narrowing it down and saying, this is the key. And again, out of the fullness of his grace, we receive, receive, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. One gift after another. All because of who it was who was born in Bethlehem. All because that child of Bethlehem, the perfect one, is also the one who went to the cross and walked out of that tomb. And because he did, I won't do this. But if I asked you, if you're going to heaven, please raise your hand. I know every hand would go up in here. And I know why. It's not because you say, well, I'm a pretty good person, or I try my best, or I sure hope so. You would confidently say that because you know who was born, who lived, who died, who rose for you. Not just some guy, not just a really good teacher, the Son of God, the perfect Savior, the promised one who did everything you needed him to do, and will keep on doing that until heaven is your home. Now, do we deserve this? No. Like we said, there's a reason we confess our sins every time we're here. Because we struggle every second of every single day. Sometimes we don't even know it. But do we have it? Yes, we do. We have grace upon grace upon grace. Gifts that have been given to us because of our Savior's work for us. And unlike the Christmas gifts, I don't know about you, but I waited as long as I could. I took down the tree today and got rid of all that stuff, including putting the gifts in a closet. And I'll probably forget they're there until 10, 11 months from now. But of course, the gifts from our Savior on Christmas, they never fail us, and they're always with us. And that list is extensive. It's grace, it's peace, it's love, it's confidence, it's certainty, it's hope, it's all those things, and so much more. And we know we have them because of whom they come from. The Savior was the perfect one who did everything we needed him to do. So, every time I use the KISS principle in church, I have to give that caveat. I'm going to say that S word. A lot of parents yell at me for using the S-T-U-P-I-D one, not that other S word. Well, I'd like that I found this because now we can change it. There is so much about our reading that we could talk about and go on and on and on. There's so many things about Christmas that could just almost boggle our minds, but keep it super simple. During Christmas and as we carry Christmas with us into this new year. And what does keeping it super simple mean? A Savior was born for us, the perfect Savior. He did the work to earn that title, giving his life and rising again. And because he did, we know our Lord will hold us close until heaven is our home. Grace upon grace upon grace. That is, thank God, the never-ending blessings of Christmas. Gifts to us from our Savior. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ our Savior. We join in confessing our faith responsibly using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. At this time, we gather a thank offering for our Lord. If you haven't done so, please leave a record of your visit by either passing down the friendship registers, or you can scan the QR code on page, second last page in our worship folder. Lord of glory, we ask you to be with those members of our congregation who this coming week will be celebrating birthdays. We ask you to be with those couples who will soon be celebrating a wedding anniversary. And be with anyone who struggles in any way, be it physically, emotionally, and above all, spiritually. Give them encouragement and strength. Give them healing and above all, hope that in all things you are with them and will work all things for their good. This we ask in our Savior's name. Hear us as we join in praying the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Gracious Lord, as we complete another Christmas season, we thank you for all the truths we began heard this Christmas that reminded us of your amazing love. You sent your Son into this world for us. Through his sacrifice, you took away all our sins. You welcomed us into your family, and in time you will welcome us to the home in heaven Jesus won for us. Though we soon end the Christmas season, help us to have Christmas hope and joy every day of our lives here on earth. In your blessed Son's name we pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our final verse.